There we go again. A uh, wake up for fakey kaiwals. Again, just for the sake of repetition, I, I've tried my hands at different kinds of uh, situations with fakey kaiwals. Extreme situations, high powers, high cylinders, corneal scars, perforation repairs, a lot of these patients. So helpful tips which will help us to actually plan uh, the right outcome with the right patient, selection of the patient and uh, deciding the outcomes. I have no financial relationship to disclose for any of the products I'll be talking here. There are various options available in the fake lenses in the, and I have a large experiences with the IPCL and ICL both, though there are many other products in the market. And I would say that uh, the best would be to, uh, you know, uh, mind some features here. Uh, whenever you have myopia, which is apart from the axial myopia, corneal dystrophy, anterior chamber depth, which is less than 2.8 millimeters, of course, you can get away with the other little uh, shallower anterior chamber chambers also. But yes, it needs a lot of practice and a lot of experience to do that. History of old uveitis, posterior sinicae, lens rise. Again, I've realized over time, if the lens rise is more than 600 microns, we'll be talking about this in detail as we move along, is a little bit of a slight contraindication. Iris cyst, I have two patients, as I did mention, uh, which were having an irregular vault, and I would try and dial the, the fake lens in, and I would again have a shifting of the fake lens and a tilt. Then I did a UBM to realize that there was a, a RS cyst, uh, so I had to expand the lens there. History of shallow RDs or retina detachments and keratoconus. As I was saying, keratoconus is an interesting situation where you will have a steeper cornea in the center, you will have a good anterior chamber depth, but the angles are not that good. So it's always a great idea not to proceed with in a patient of keratoconus. Uh, if you have not done your gonioscopy. That's, I think that's a warning. I, I've done a lot of cases and I've learned that lesson. There are different kinds of powers available. As I, you can see here, IPCL here is available in powers up to 30 and I've done up to minus 36. Cylinders, officially they're available till eight, eight diopters, but I've done till eight, 11 and recently I've done a 14 diopters of astigmatism also. The sizes available are, so this will help you to plan for your patients. Now, these are the sizes available in the ICA. There are only four sizes available, wherein in the IPCL, you will have 13 sizes available. So th that's why an IPCL has become my personal favorite because I can fine tune and tailor it to the requirement of my patients. General, again, you will can have up between 11.5 to 14 millimeters as we repeat. Now, another good thing is that in, when you're working up for a fake IL in a toric patient, you need to have a very, very accurate, uh, precise, the keratometry and the astigmatic power of this patient. Uh, luckily for us in IPCL, you have a customized lens which just needs to be put at 0, 180 degrees and it can get away with that. We've done up to more than 2,200 cases till now. And this is a brief uh, summary of all the cases which we've done. Now, preoperative, this is an important slide, though this is a very, very uh, busy slide here, but there's a lot of information here. Very, very important point is we need to do a dilated acceptance of all our patients. A white to white measurement is important in all these patients. And especially if the astigmatism is more than two diopters, I personally do a vertical white to white also because it helps me to plan the size in case I have a large pupil size. Now pupil size measurement is very important. So I would recommend all the beginners to do a preoperative scotopic pupil size and also see what is the maximum dilatation achieved in these patients. There are some patients where the preoperative pupil size scotopic would be a decent one, but it would not dilate beyond a particular point. So there you can get caught up, especially if you have a larger cornea white to white, because you need to put in a large lens. And if your pupil does not dilate beyond, let's say 7.5 or 8 millimeters, then you're stuck up. Keratoconus, I did mention, you have to be very, very careful. You need to measure your lens rise on your OCT. Keratometry readings, as I said, if there are more than two diopters of keratometry uh, uh, shifting, please measure the vertical keratometry also. Doing a gonioscopy always makes a sense in these patients because you can land up in surprise with some patients. And of course, a specular microscopy in these patients. What are the practical breaking points which can happen? You know, if you've not done a good cycloplegic refraction, because I, in, in my initial cases, I had patients who were wearing minus nine diopters of spectacles. And on an AR, I was probably refractive getting an 8.75. I did end up getting and correcting them for a minus nine. And I realized they were probably accommodating because they were wearing wrong power glasses. Similarly, large size resting pupils need to be mentioned in your file and measured because you need a larger size optic. Here again, an IPCL comes to your rescue because you can actually order large size IPCLs. I have done up to 8.5 millimeters of IPCL. 
putting a pilocarpine, I personally avoid any kind of a myotic in these patients because they make the sh wall shallow initially, and this wall will again go back to its normal within three to four days' time. Watch out for uh, the IOP peak, especially patients. These patients are highly susceptible to be steroid responders, so they can have an IOP peak within first two days, could be detained with scoelastic, or they could have an IOP peak maybe after five to six days if they are steroid responders. Cycloplegic refraction is very important just for the sake of repetition. Measuring dilated and undilated pupil is very important and note down in your file. There are various methods you can use that. I use a dynamic pupillometry on my serious machines to do that. In case you're using a caliper or an image based infrared uh, method, always use the outer limb line. You can use your auto refractor keratometer to do these. Yes, if your interior chamber depth is 2.8, are you safe? I would say yes and no. Look for angle anomalies, look for iris configurations, look for lens rise, look for keratoconus, because then you can land up in situation. Now, this is what a lens rise is. If you draw a straight line on your OCT diagram from one angle to another, the number of, the amount of microns the lens rises up from this straight line is your lens rise. So anything more than 600 microns, you need to be a little bit careful. So plan your vault slightly higher than you would. So probably going in for a higher 2.25 millimeter higher size than you would. Wide to wide measurement is one of the most important uh, hallmarks of this situation. You can use different machines, but standardize your nomograms to whatever machine you're using. So I would not recommend any one machine, whatever you're using, standardize it. I am personally very, very happy with Cirrus measurements. I've done more than 2000 of cases using this machine. So as I just said, if there's a variance of more than 0.2 millimeter between both the white to whites, recheck again. Until and unless there is more of uh, 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 astigmatism here. Now this, I think after this, I'll just have the last slide. Now, in case you're planning a toric IPCL, um, this is a slide which I, I borrowed from Manchu. Please conclude. Uh, yeah, I'm just finishing last slide. Really, really in you. case you're planning a toric IPCL, I would recommend go for a slightly larger size because these lenses would fit snugly and they are lesser prone to rotation. Thank you. Thank you, Kamal. It was an excellent talk as usual. I think the, probably the highest numbers of IPCL in the world, probably you are the man might have done. Thank you. Thank you.